thanks everyone. Um, I'm going to give a talk tonight. I'm going to talk a little bit about the work the NFU is doing on climate change. And then I'm going to just uh, give you some background information on climate change with some specific data around BC. So one of the things I'm doing, some of you uh, may have seen the presentation at national convention. Uh, you may have seen the data that's and the graphs that are in the tackling report, but uh, these regional conventions give me an opportunity to show you the province specific data. I, I am going to apologize. I, I only have the BC data in here, so I don't have the Northwest Territories and Yukon data. Uh, but uh, if there is a real curiosity around that, I can uh, I can generate those graphs next week. So the talk tonight is called uh, Food, Farms and Climate and the Future, Eight Things People Should Know and Eight Government Policies We Need. So before I get into the, the graphs and the data, I, I just want to talk about the NFU's policy work because it is super uh, exciting right now. Uh, the NFU is really positioned to become a Canadian leader on the issue of climate change. The NFU was tremendously courageous uh, in the stances they've taken. Uh, going back many years, we had one of the first really good analyses of climate change uh, more than 10 years ago. And then in 2019, the NFU uh, very courageously uh, agreed to publish the tackling the farm crisis and the climate crisis report that, uh, that, that laid things out, I think, in a, in a fairly clear, uh, clear way. So uh, the NFU is really a leader on this. When I was working on the tackling report, I assumed that the work wouldn't be that hard, that I would just look around the world at other jurisdictions and see the reports in other countries where they figured out how to reduce emissions by 30 or 50%. And what I found was those reports just didn't exist. So uh, the NFU has really published one of the first reports in the world that really is a roadmap to not only figure out how to reduce emissions by 30 or 50%, but to at the same time, increase net farm income and loosen the control that corporations have on family farms. So very, NFU is really a leader. Uh, they were also in the lead in, in helping to found Farmers for Climate Solutions. Uh, Farmers for Climate Solutions is doing tremendous work right now. It's a coalition, currently about 16 or 17 organizations, but growing very quickly. Uh, Farmers for Climate Solutions and uh, the NFU, uh, myself, we met with uh, Canada's Federal Minister of Agriculture in the last couple of weeks. Uh, Farmers for Climate Solutions and, and an NFU rep, uh, Dana Penrice, met with uh, the Minister of Agriculture, uh, Bebo, uh, in the last couple of weeks. And also uh, just here uh, last week, uh, the NFU and Farmers for Climate Solutions, we had sent letters in to Prime Minister Trudeau asking him to include in the throne speech very specific language around farmers taking the lead to tackle uh, the emissions and, and climate problems. And exactly the words that we wanted in that throne street speech were in there. And the Minister of Agriculture staff even reached out after and said, uh, you know, we heard you, we included your language in the throne speech. And, you know, uh, that, that's really, really key. When we met with bureaucrats in the Department of Agriculture uh, last month, they were kind of leaning back in their chairs uh, climate change was an emissions reduction wasn't a priority. Uh, farm resilience, uh, the health of soils, those things really weren't priorities it, because it wasn't in the mandate letter. By getting this language into the throne speech, it means we can get it into the mandate letters. And when it's in the mandate letters, it means that's a priority in those departments. And the next time we meet with those bureaucrats, they're going to be leaning forward because they're going to know that, that a lot of people higher up are looking at them and looking at their success in finding ways to make farmers more climate resilient and finding ways to make uh, our farms uh, lower emissions. So tremendous first step in getting this into the throne speech and that's thanks to the NFU and Farmers for Climate Solutions. Uh, and you know at the heart of it the NFU is interested in the climate issue because it's a, it's a critical issue for 
the biosphere, for farmers, for civilization, but also because this is the way that we can move uh, Canadian agriculture policy. This is the lever that we can use right now. And in recent decades, we've had a, a Canadian agriculture policy that was really focused on increasing exports, increasing production, increasing input use. It was highly uh, influenced and shaped by corporate power and corporations were taking most of the, the wealth out of the system. The climate crisis really means that a lot of what's happening in agriculture has to change dramatically. And we think we can use this historic moment to shift the direction of Canadian agriculture policy in a way that is much more supportive of family farms and their resilience and of a livable biosphere and, and a much better uh, economic and environmental future for family farms. So that's, that's one of the key reasons that, that the NFU is putting so much emphasis on, on the climate issue. Uh, just uh, today, we published three new two-page fact sheets on the uh, NFU website. The, the climate web pages and the NFU site have been uh, revamped as of today. Uh, they now feature these three two-pagers. Uh, these are really the, the go-to documents. You know, you can, you can read each one in a few minutes. The first one really summarizes a lot of what the points I'm going to make tonight. It lists eight things people should know about the climate crisis. And then on the other side, eight government policies that the NFU wants the government to enact in order to reduce emissions, build resilience, and increase incomes. The second one talks directly to NFU members, associate members, youth, retired farmers, and even other citizens, and helps people understand how they can weigh in. The, uh, the leadership, the elected leaders, and the staff of the NFU are working really hard on this issue. Uh, Katie's been working really hard. We've got some great new staff in, uh, in BC, uh, Laura and Freya. Uh, so the staff is doing everything they can, but to really make these changes fast enough, uh, we, we really need the help of just about every NFU member and associate member in this second flyer kind of lays out how they can help. And the third one responds to a need that our members identified, and that is they wanted to know what they should be looking at on their farms in terms of long-term planning to reduce emissions and position their farms so that you know, they can be part of the solution. And also that they're not destabilized or blindsided when the, when the country starts to move much more quickly to, uh, to reduce emissions. So, uh, so that's kind of an overview of the work that the NFU is doing. I, I urge you all to get as involved as you can. It really is exciting. Things are moving super fast right now. When you get two ministers meetings and a uh, mention in the throne speech in a couple of weeks, uh, you know, things are, a lot of things are possible that just weren't possible uh, even in, in July or August. So yeah, it, it's, it's a very interesting and, and exciting policy sphere right now. So uh, I'm going to just tell you some things about climate change. Some you'll know, some you won't. And I'm going to show you some BC specific uh, information. Some of it's provocative. Uh, by that, I mean, it, it, it might make you think, it might make you sort of uh, come up with a, a counter argument or a critique. I hope it makes you come up with some questions. And, and we're going to have some time for questions and, and debate and, and conversation at the end. So here we go. Eight things you should know. The first thing is uh, greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere are going up very hot, very fast and they are very high. There's three main greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide. I'm gonna show you all three. The first one is carbon dioxide. Globally, CO2 drives about 70% of the heating. It is the main driver of uh, climate change and global warming. Uh, this is a graph of CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere over the last 800,000 years. You can see that, uh, yes, CO2 levels went up and CO2 levels went down. Uh, the low points in the graph actually correspond to what we call ice ages. There's about a dozen of them there. But I want to just focus in on two things. 
Uh, during that 800,000 year period, even though CO2 levels went up and down, not once did they rise above 300 parts per million. That's kind of the 800,000 year normal is 300 parts per million max. They're at 417 right now and odds are they'll get to 500 at some point here in the next few decades. So the first thing I wanna point out is just how high those are, unprecedented levels. Second thing I wanna point out is how fast they're rising. So uh, I hope you can see me jiggling the cursor down here. Uh, down at this low point, just before the, the, the modern era, you know, the last 10,000 years, that low point between that and 1900 was an increase of about 100 parts per million. That took 10,000 years. Now, if you look between 1900 and 2020, that's another approximately 100 parts per million. But that only took 100 years. So you get 100 parts per million rise over 10,000 years, and then you get 100 parts per million rise over 100 years. CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere are rising 100 times faster than what is normal in the historic record. 100 times faster. Clearly, this is driven by human action, and it's being driven extremely fast. So that's uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Oh, I went backwards. Uh, this is methane, a little different time span here. This is only 10,000 years, kind of short term. Uh, you can see that methane concentrations in the atmosphere were more or less stable uh, over about 9,900 years till about 1800 or 1900. And then they shot almost straight up. Uh, they more or less tripled from just over 600 parts per million to now just over 1,800 parts per million. The main sources of uh, methane are uh, landfills, rice cultivation, uh, cattle and other grazing animals, and quite, uh, quite important in Western Canada, uh, oil and gas production. Third major greenhouse gas is nitrous oxide. You can see that it is also at a a uh, high point uh, in the last 800,000 or a million years. Uh, and uh, I, I should have mentioned uh, methane is a greenhouse gas about 28 times more powerful than carbon dioxide in terms of capturing heat. And nitrous oxide is a greenhouse gas 265 times more powerful than CO2 when it comes to capturing heat. And the main source for nitrous oxide is nitrogen fertilizer use. So not surprisingly, if the three main greenhouse gases are becoming uh, more, uh, more, there's more higher concentration in the atmosphere, temperatures are going up too, they're driving warming. So this is a graph of uh, the last 140 years. You can see temperatures were fairly stable up until uh, about 50 years ago when they started moving up quite quickly. And uh, we are up about one degree over the uh, sort of late 20th century normal. And uh, we've almost certainly emitted enough greenhouse gases into the atmosphere to get to one and a half. And uh, if we keep emitting more, uh, we're gonna go past one and a half very quickly. And uh, it's hard to say just how high it's gonna go. The best estimate from the uh, United Nations in what's called the UN GAPS report. And I think there's gonna be another one, a, a new version coming out here in the next month or two. Uh, the UN GAPS report projects that we are on track for 3.2 degrees of warming. They take all of the emission reduction commitments, all of the programs that are out there, the, the promise Canada made in Paris to reduce by 30%, the promises that the Europeans made in Paris to reduce by whatever percent they committed to. They take all of the programs, all of the promises and assume everyone's gonna do what they said they're gonna do. And uh, when they put that into a climate model, a climate model predicts that with with those levels of, of commitment we get about 3.2 degrees of warming so if you look around the world at the fires and the droughts and the storms and everything else uh, we've got now that's one degree and uh, if we don't get more ambitious and more effective and more successful and emissions reduction uh, we'll go past two degrees and we'll go past even three degrees 
so I just want to show you now some BC specific data. This is a, a graph of greenhouse gas emissions in British Columbia from 1990 to 2018, so 28 years. Uh, there's a, a different categories there, but it's, it's really a little simpler than it looks uh, at first. The blue areas at the bottom are mainly nitrogen fertilizer related. So the light blue is the production of nitrogen fertilizer. So the carbon dioxide that comes out of nitrogen fertilizer factories. And the dark blue is the nitrous oxide emissions that come from soils when uh, nitrogen is used. Uh, the red is mostly diesel fuel. There's a tiny bit of gasoline in there. Uh, in British Columbia, there isn't a lot of uh, CO2 from electrical production like there would be in Saskatchewan where I live. Uh, the green is mostly cattle. Uh, the dark green is enteric emissions from the mouths of cattle and the light green is emissions from manure of all species. Uh, BC is, it's not, no, no province is really a great news story, but BC is, is relatively good compared to a lot of other provinces. Uh, in BC, your greenhouse gases from agriculture are about 4% of the provincial total. Uh, that number gets as high as 40% in Manitoba. Uh, and I think in Saskatchewan, we're in the 30s, uh, high 20s or low 30s. So it's not a huge uh, problem in BC. Uh, I, I've done these graphs for just about every province and uh, BC looks significantly different than a lot in that the top line isn't going up. In Saskatchewan, the top line is going up very dramatically and the blue is a much bigger chunk. Uh, BC is, is dominated by emissions from cattle. In a lot of the western provinces, it's really dominated by emissions from nitrogen fertilizer. Nitrogen fertilizer is really the big driver of uh, emissions all across Canada. So some of the good news is that uh, the emissions from nitrogen aren't nearly as large in BC and unlike a lot of provinces, they're not going up. That isn't to say there isn't work to be done, but uh, in some provinces that top line is uh, arcing up fairly, fairly steeply. Uh, 40, 50, 60% increases over the 28 year period. Um, so as I implied, uh, the main driver of whether emissions are going up or down in BC is just the size of the cattle herd. So on the left is a graph of uh, total cattle numbers and on the right is that uh, emissions graph. And you can see that uh, the emissions more or less mirror uh, the number of cattle in the province. And uh, n none of this is to imply that somehow uh, cattle are, are uh, a bad thing. If you've read the tackling report, you know that we go to some significant, uh, some significant effort to sort of frame this in a, in a balanced and nuanced way. So uh, anyway, we'll get to that here a little later in the presentation. Um, this next slide is, is not, as applicable in British Columbia, but it, it's a really big issue across Canada. And that is a lot of people want to kind of wish away the uh, agricultural emissions issue by really focusing on soil carbon sequestration. And uh, I, this graph is by the Government of Canada, Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. And what it shows is Canadian emissions and that's the the dark colored bars that reach upward and then those gold bars that reach downward are carbon sequestration from cropland it, it doesn't include grassland and hayland it doesn't include grazing it just includes cropping systems what a lot of people think of as zero till um, no till agriculture and there's a couple of things i want you to see there one is uh, emissions are quite large compared to the sequestration effect. And two, the sequestration effect is getting smaller over time because you can only get so much carbon into soils before they reach a new equilibrium. Uh, and what Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada says and a lot of scientists around the world point out is that 
uh, after some decades of good practices, you you know farmers do a good thing in that they manage to get more carbon into the soils, but eventually those soils slow down in terms of the rate that they take up that carbon. So uh, uh, best possible grazing and best possible cropping systems are absolutely uh, the thing to do. Building soil, building soil organic carbon, building soil organic matter, uh, absolutely essential. You know, and, and it does take carbon out of the air. That's that's true, but it just unfortunately isn't a big enough thing to to be a, a major offset to agricultural emissions, and it certainly isn't. It certainly can't do what, for instance, people in that movie um, kiss the kiss the ground, kiss the kiss the earth. Uh, it certainly can't do what Paul Hawken implies in that movie, and that is draw down all of the CO2 that's ever been emitted from human civilization and fossil fuels, etc. So, uh, yeah. Uh, last thing I'll say. Uh, and before I turn to the policy solutions, I just want to look a little bit at the at the farm income situation. Because one thing we point out in the tackling report is farmers over the last few generations have urged have been urged to become ever more dependent on purchased inputs. And as they have become more dependent on purchased inputs, their emissions have gone up and their margins have gone down. What we see in the report is, uh, agriculture doesn't actually produce greenhouse gas emissions. Agricultural inputs produce greenhouse gas emissions. So we had almost, we've had 10,000 years of agriculture. And for 9,900 of those years, agriculture did not change the chemistry of the atmosphere. It did not destabilize the climate. It didn't cause warming. So for 99% of the time that humans have practiced agriculture, it was zero emission and, and did not destabilize the climate. It's only in the last 100 years that agriculture has become a significant source of greenhouse gas emissions. And that is because farmers have been urged to become ever more dependent upon energy intensive high emission inputs. And as farmers have become more, uh, more dependent on those inputs, the input suppliers, people that sell those inputs, have positioned themselves to take ever more of the wealth created on our farm. So this is a graph of British Columbia gross farm revenue. That's the black line that goes up. And uh, realized net farm income, that's the gray line that goes down. Both lines are adjusted for inflation so that it's, you can meaningfully compare uh, numbers from the 30s or 50s or 70s with those today. So it's inflation adjusted. And in, in, for both lines, I've taken out uh, agricultural subsidies because agricultural subsidies often mask what is happening. Uh, in Canada, for instance, in many years, subsidy payments from government financed by taxpayers are, are so significant, so large, that in some years they actually double net farm income. Uh, the markets will give farmers two or three billion in net income and taxpayers will give farmers two or three billion in net income. And then farmers might borrow another two or three billion and we end up with a debt crisis. I, uh, you've probably seen some talk about that in the NFU uh, union farmer. So uh, these lines are adjusted for inflation and they are from the, the money is from the markets. They're, they're net of subsidies. So uh, you can see gross revenue is up, net farm income goes down. I'll just color that in. So the, the green uh, shaded areas are years when farmers had positive net incomes in BC. The red areas are negative. Uh, again, it's... Uh, 90 some years, 1926 to 2019. And I'll just co color in the area between uh, gross revenue and net income, that blue area. Uh, what's the difference between gross revenue and net income? It's farmers' costs, it's their expenses, it's what they pay for fertilizer 
and chemicals and machinery and repairs and plastic and seeds and uh, fuel and chemicals and all that stuff. Uh, it's what they give, it's the money they give to deer and, and Bayer Monsanto and Nutrien and Angrium, et cetera. And, and you can see what's happened over the last uh, almost a hundred years. Those input suppliers have taken a bigger and bigger and bigger chunk of the wealth that, that farmers in BC are producing. And I'll just put some numbers to it. Uh, from the end of the depression till the mid seventies, farmers in BC got to keep about 39 cents out of every dollar they produced. If you look at the time since 1976, farmers have kept virtually zero. It's, it's one tenth of 1%. The 99.9% of the wealth generated by farmers has been captured by agribusiness companies that sell inputs. Uh, it might it might be not be quite that bad. There might be like one or two percent in there. Uh, that's it's a little hard to account for money that goes to some of the on farm family labor. But you know, best case scenario, the input sellers are getting ninety five percent of the wealth. And how do farmers continue? Well, there's subsidies, there's increasing debt, there's off farm work. So that's the uh, that's the income side, uh, the income situation, and we think that the income crisis and the emissions and, and climate crisis have uh, a lot of the same causes, and and a big one is just a, a massive overdependence by farmers on petroleum derived high emission purchased inputs. So uh, I'm just going to quickly go through some of the policies that can not only begin to reduce emissions and, and help build resilience, but um, also hopefully uh, start to increase incomes and give farmers more control and autonomy by helping to loosen the grip of the agribusiness corporations. So cattle. Um, again, I urge you to read the, the tackling report, the chapter on cattle. You'll see just the, the complexity and the nuance of this. I can't do it justice here, so forgive me, but uh, I, 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 really, I really like cattle and, and Jan Slump and Paul and Blake Hall and a whole bunch of other people have uh, stood over me patiently and educated me, schooled me, I guess, on uh, the benefits of cattle and I, I'm completely on side on all of that. So, um, but it, it remains the case that cattle do emit methane when they eat grass. Uh, but cattle provide many benefits and they help uh, create and maintain healthy, diverse grassland ecosystems. They provide manure uh, for cyclical nutrient flows where farms can be less dependent on purchased nitrogen and they help with uh, on-farm diversification. They build soil and they increase soil carbon. I, I ran across a quote, uh, God does not farm without animals. Uh, and, you know, if we imagine a, a healthy, diverse ecosystem, we just close our eyes and imagine a, a healthy ecosystem, we're going to imagine a landscape with animals on it. So it, it doesn't make any sense to think that somehow removing animals from the landscape is, is the way to create healthy ecosystems. That said, we need to find a way to keep cattle on the land, but we have to tackle the methane problem. So again, just in BC, the, the, the majority of the emissions are from cattle. Um, what we think is important is to really go back and, and look at the goals that we have for cattle production, and then look at what's, how we could achieve those goals, and then contrast that to what the industry would have us do. <clears throat> so one goal is to, uh, use cattle to, to help build the soil and to increase carbon levels. So in order to do that, we'd want animals on grass and we'd want to use best possible grazing management, uh, holistic, rotational, regenerative grazing. Uh, what does the industry do? Well, the industry wants to put animals in feedlots and barns where they're not building soil. Uh, another goal could be to maximize the number of sustainable livelihoods. Thus, we'd want many small and medium-sized uh, cattle and livestock producers and dispersed production units. But the industry tends to be pushing the whole system toward mega operations and concentrated production. 
Uh, the goal might be to maximize enjoyment for meat uh, consumption, to, to make people really relish uh, meat, and really, really value it. Uh, so what we need to do there is we need to focus on quality and excellence. Uh, the industry wants instead to maximize production of commodity protein and you know maximize the number of drive-through hamburgers they can serve uh, to people that mostly aren't really paying attention and, and don't really value and, and savor that meat. Another goal could be to maximize the supply of food for human beings. If we want to do that, we'd want animals eating wastes or grazing on non-arable land. We wouldn't want them eating grain that could be used to feed humans. But of course, the industry approach is to increasingly feed animals on grain. And, and not to say that grain feeding is, uh, you know, it, it's often necessary, certainly out here in Western Canada, where we have uh, about 11 months of winter sometimes. Uh, we're going to feed some grain that we can't graze all year. But uh, the large feedlots and the focus on grain feeding is something we should probably examine. And the last goal might be to uh, maximize the chance of reducing methane. So in order to do that, we probably want to look at having fewer animals and less meat consumption, uh, not dramatically fewer and dramatically less, but maybe some. Uh, but of course, the industry, both in Canada and globally, wants to double and redouble uh, animal numbers in meat and milk consumption. Uh, on nitrogen the policies we need, we need to use nitrogen efficiently. And there's a suite of programs that go under the name 4R, uh, the right product, the right time, the right place, and the right rate. Uh, it's a way of using nitrogen efficiently. We probably want to reduce use overall, so we need better soil testing, maybe a small tax on nitrogen to fund research into nitrogen reduction, and the government probably wants targets. The European Union recently came out with a target. They are committed to reducing nitrogen use by 20% uh, over the next 20 years. So other jurisdictions are looking at absolute reductions of nitrogen. If you look at what's happening in uh, Saskatchewan, Alberta, Manitoba, uh, you see them doubling, tripling, and quadrupling nitrogen use in the last 30 years. In Saskatchewan here, farmers are using four times as much nitrogen as they were in the early 1990s. And we probably want to reduce that nitrogen without emissions, so use renewable energy and uh, maybe carbon capture and storage at those nitrogen fertilizer plants. We want to diversify cropping approaches. So we want more complex rotations. We want more farmers to use cover crops and we want to uh, get more farmers doing intercropping, multi-species in the same field. We want to multiply the number of organic farms and acres. We want more farms to embrace agroecology, holistic management, uh, similar approaches. And we want to increase the number of farmers on the land in order to increase resilience and adaptability. Climate change is coming. It's going to destabilize things. And the more farmers we have on the land observing and making managerial changes and, and shepherding those transitions that need to be made, the better. If we move to a system where there's a, a smaller number of huge operations, highly leveraged uh, at, with very specialized equipment, those are not the kind of operations that can make quick, uh, quick responses to very quickly changing conditions that we're going to see in climate change. Uh, we want low input agriculture. Uh, we have a, a concept called MINT agriculture, which stands for minimum input no-till. Essentially, you take all the best ideas of organic, like getting your nutrients without buying fertilizer, uh, dealing with pests in ways that, that utilize biological systems rather than chemical systems. You take the best ideas from organic and you take the best ideas from no-till, low disturbance, and, and it's, it's not organic. Uh, you probably can't scale up organic to you know, cover half or two thirds or all of Canadian cropland. So what you want is a, a low input hybrid system that can be used where people aren't organic, but that maximizes uh, production w within certain limits, of course, but while simultaneously minimizing input use and emissions. 
Um, you want to you want to switch over to uh, low emission, zero emission fuels, and electrify everything. And uh, Drew and Joanne might be able to uh, give some really good comments uh, when I conclude my talk here in a couple of minutes. Uh, I know they've uh, done some of this with their electric tractor, but essentially you want to electrify everything possible. So electrify water heating and building heating, electrify trucks and tractors, install on-farm solar arrays maybe manure biodigesters, uh, retrofit farm buildings and homes so they use less energy, and improve the building codes for new construction. So whether it's passive house or net zero or lead, we need to stop building buildings that uh, require a lot of energy to heat and cool. Set aside programs, we wanna probably take about five to 10% of cropland out of production, the, the, the least productive five or 10%. In, in any province, if you identify the least productive land, you're probably looking at land that people are putting a lot of inputs into. So you've got a lot of emissions coming out, but they're not producing much crop. And uh, the farmers are probably losing money. So it's, it's a real lose-lose. You've, you've got people cropping acres on which they consistently lose money but that they're putting inputs into, so you get a lot of emissions out. We wanna look at uh, planting trees. The fancy word for that is afforestation. Uh, that creates wildlife habitat. We probably want to preserve the wetlands we have, maybe restore some wetlands that farmers have destroyed over the years. A lot of co-benefits. Uh, we'll get a so soil organic matter increase from grass and grazing. And uh, by producing habitat, we'll slow the rate of extinction because we're in a, a massive extinction crisis right now, the, the fastest extinction event in 65 million years. We need new agencies and institutions. The National Farmers Union has, uh, has put forward the idea of a Canadian Farm Resilience Authority, a CFRA. And it's, it's patterned on the PFRA that was created in, during the Dust Bowl. So just as the PFRA was the response to extreme weather, soil degradation, et cetera, the CFRA would sort of be an updated 21st century version that would help farmers navigate the climate crisis, emission reduction, and, uh, and building resilience on their farms. So it would do things like overseeing independent soil testing, uh, managing fertilizer reduction, research, administering set-aside programs, helping proliferate grazing, best management practices, running demonstration farms where low input agriculture could be, the methods could be refined and showcased and farmers could come in and see how they could, for instance, use 20 or 30% less fertilizer and still get the same yields. So in general, a CFRA would oversee the technical aspects of the transition to climate compatible agriculture. It would give farmers the support, the knowledge uh, that they need to, to make these transitions. And the last one, and, and this is controversial, but a carbon tax and refund system uh, for agriculture. Uh, in, in a nutshell, a, a properly designed carbon tax and refund system for agriculture would collect carbon taxes from farmers and then return the money back to farmers it would take into account the imbalance in market power. So essentially, if you put a carbon tax on things like fertilizer producers and, and chemical producers and machinery producers, they're gonna pass all of that carbon tax back down to the farmer in the form of higher input costs. And if you put carbon taxes on the trucks that haul the grain away or you know the processors, they're gonna pass that back to farmers in the form of lower, um, lower product prices. So you take that into account at the front end and you just say, look, farmers are gonna be made to pay all of these taxes. So they should receive all of this tax money back so that farmers as a whole aren't any worse off. Yet you rebate it back in a way that's based on farm size, not emissions, such that the farms that are using less, fewer inputs per uh, an average or producing lower emissions than average will come up money ahead those that are using more inputs and producing more emissions than average will come out money behind. And you end up with a net transfer to the farms that are doing the right thing and you, you help give them the capital that they need to invest in even more emission reduction. 
So just to, just to recap quickly, uh, in terms of cattle, we want to maximize the benefits while reducing impacts and numbers. On nitrogen, we want to use it more efficiently. We want to use less of it. We want to produce it without emissions. Cropping systems, we want to diversify them, including better rotations, cover crops, organic agriculture, agroecology. Uh, also under cropping, we want to create uh, low input hybrid systems in order to produce crops with the lowest emissions per ton of output. For fuels and energy, we want to electrify everything possible. In terms of land use, we want to set aside some of the, the crop land that's currently not very productive and, and restore it to wildlife habitat uh, that's more biodiverse. We need some new institutions such as a CFRA and we want to a limited extent to use some price signals and a bit of market mechanism such as a carbon tax and refund system. So that's, uh, that's my talk for tonight. Uh, there's a, a lot of detail in the tackling report. And so if you're interested, I, I invite you to take a look at that and I'd be happy to take any questions or hear comments. Hi, Darren, it's Carmen. Just wondering, are you able to share your slides? Yeah. Um, Excellent. Who could I send them to and then they could, or how do we, and what's the special uh, distribution method here? I'll do my best to distribute them. The talk will also be posted on YouTube um, okay. on the NFU channel. So if you can find NFU Canada, um, you'll find it there within the next few days. Thank you. Also, Darren, I would uh, love to see the Yukon or NWT slides. Okay. And I saw Wendy with her hand up. Yeah. <laughs> Wendy, <laughs> put my count on. <laughs> um, I, 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 it was a great presentation, Darren. Thank you so much, so much, and so much in it. And um, I just wanted to add something that sort of sounds like from left field, but I just want to bring it to your attention because you're working on big policy issues and it, it, it impacts the farm gate and the sustainability of agriculture. It's a changing climate for agriculture, but that climate has to do with the super concentration and the marketing chain at retail. And um, the effect of that change in climate in the marketing chain, um, Canadian Federation of Agriculture just put out an excellent presser on it in August. Um, they are pushing back on suppliers uh, because they have the market power to do so to get shelf space uh, for kickbacks that the processors then have to push back onto the farmers and it all winds up at the farm gate. And um, the UK uh, took it to their combines branch and came up with some uh, solutions for this. Canada really needs to put this at the feet of our competition bureau and, and come up with something because uh, it is coming right back to farmers. Uh, Walmart said, I think that their $1.6 billion of cost of expanding in Canada was all going to be paid for by the, by the supply chain and, and they have the power to do it. So this is, uh, as, we, as we look at the importance of agriculture in, uh, in, in the whole uh, greenhouse gas emissions and climate change and ecological agriculture and small farms uh, um, uh, sphere, I just want to be keep you mindful of that of what's happening in that the changing climate and the marketing chain. So per, permit me for throwing that in. But no, I, I completely agree, Wendy. It's a great point, and uh, I hope that the National Observer and Mark Fox at Adnerson Atkinson, uh, he's based in BC. I, I hope they do a piece on uh, food retail power here pretty soon. They were just in contact with Kathy Olslander and myself and got some graphs from us. And I, I was really heartened to see that they were making uh, food retailer power uh, an issue. Mm. Can you send me something offline on that to connect me to them? I'd like to. Sure. To yep. Any more questions? Darren, um, I just have a question about um, the graph and I and not to like unpack whether se uh, sequestration is 
viable or valuable of a conversation around that. But um, there's definitely a lot of larger scale regenerative grazers in the peace region. Um, and I'm just curious about like, is there, do you, do you see that equation changing at all when they account for more production other than zero till? Um, also knowing some larger scale grain producers here that have questioned the viability of no-till production just because of that, mm -hmm. that uh, nutrient binding in soils and that type of thing. And just curious about what you've learned in that or what you anticipate for, for that. Thanks for the question, Bess. Um, the, the thing, the problem we have is that there's a certain layer of advocates that, that are really overstating what sequestration can do. And, you know, if, if you watch that documentary, Kiss the Ground, and that graph of Paul Hawkins, and essentially, you know, he takes you back to pre-industrial levels in 50 years uh, with this idea of drawdown. Um, soil sequestration is real. It, it, it puts carbon into the soil. It builds soil. It, it, it's fantastic. I mean, we, we should do it as fast as we can. And, and I, you know, to some extent, farmers should get paid for doing these practices in order to encourage that for sure it, it everything is true about that except when they get to the point where people start trotting it out as some sort of climate solution that can offset the emissions from right. california car culture or something so um yeah i i think we just need some balance because because the reason that we have found ourselves drawn into this so much is policymakers keep hearing these messages that this is almost a magical thing and then they don't focus enough on all the other things we need to do like really reducing actual carbon dioxide emissions and mostly dealing with nitrogen fertilizer like nitrogen fertilizer is the big problem in canadian agriculture not so much in bc but in the rest of the country it's huge mm -hmm. and they don't want to touch that one because it's you know fertilizer companies involved etc and that's the reason that we've had to sort of do a, a bit of a reality check on sequestration just so we could make room for the other policies that need to be pursued. Appreciate that. <laughs> Darren, I have a question for you. Um, do you have any numbers on the carbon release out of the soil as a result of nitrogen use mm. and as a result of uh, total fertility drawdown worldwide, because I think there's a significant amount of carbon released out mm -hmm. of the soil due to, um, you know, unwise fertilizer use, but also uh, from zero till or from, uh, from uh, um, um, tilling without fertilization. Uh, do you have any numbers on that? Uh, I don't have them, but I've seen, I've seen, Journal articles make exactly the point you're making. I mean, you're exactly right that fertilizer use can cause soils to, to release carbon and, and you get lower carbon soils from that. But uh, so they have numbers, but I don't have them, but I can get some. Because my suspicion is that, uh, and even before we uh, used fertilizer, you know, tilling would uh, create uh, a new nutrient release that would benefit a new seeded crop. Uh, so we have hundreds of years before fertilizer use uh, uh, that were significant reducers of uh, soil carbon too. But then mm -hmm. with, the, with the nitrogen fertilizer, we sped that up. Mm -hmm. So I believe that's where a mixed farming and, uh, and organic and, and using the uh, the nitrogen components from from legumes in the in the pasture ro and then rotating it with annual cropping can can recapture that uh, soil carbon mm -hmm. yeah legumes are really important they're, they're both more digestible to the, the livestock so you get less methane output and they're also of course nitrogen fixing so yeah legumes are really key uh, Graham, did I see you had your hand up at one point? Yeah, I did. Um, I'm curious about um, the point about bringing more, making more medium and small scale farms and 
do you when you offer these uh these policy suggestions was there a time frame or like is there a bit of a how that might happen because you know the trend is so greatly the opposite way right now with so many the average age of farmers am increasing so much and you know few young people coming to farm so would you have anything to any thoughts on that we're we're at the front we're at the front end of the kind of changes we need around climate change. So the short answer is no. The short answer is you're right. The trend lines are currently going against us. Um, you know, there's fewer farmers this year than there was five years ago. But what we would say is, if we're going to move into a place where we're going to have more farmers, one of the really powerful levers we can use is this the restructuring on climate change. So I don't think it, it, it's, it's not assured, but if we're, you know, if we build a coalition and we really manage to get the changes we need around emission reduction and resilience and break some of that corporate stranglehold, it opens the window for stabilizing and then increasing farmer numbers, especially if we can get farm incomes up. Yeah, make it more attractive and make, yeah, understand. And then I had a, I had a secondary question. Um, in your graph um, on number eight, emissions, the emissions graph, I'm curious, um, um, it's a little bit of devil's advocate here, so excuse me, but um, if you were to compare those numbers with the growth in yield over that time as well, how much yield has there been in increase? Because obviously there was a a lot more farmers in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, working more and more and more land and supposedly more efficiently with adding machines and things. Um, and, and to what extent do, does like the, the, the people of the earth uh, rely on Canadian crops for food? You know, we start to alter this. Now we alter, we need to alter it obviously. Um, but um, is, do you think that that international reliance on Canadian product would really um, push people to think about, well, look how much more food is being grown. You know, look at, you know, like, you know what I mean? Yeah, I'm sort of, yeah. I might have a lot. So, so, so two questions. One, is yield going up and how does that sort of factor in with emissions? Is, is our emissions per ton going down perhaps because yield's going up faster? And two, to what extent does the world rely on us and, and the exports. So uh, the first question is, is a good one. Um, probably it's, it's, it's paradoxical. So emissions are going up, yield is going up. Yield is probably going up a little bit faster than emissions. So emissions per ton of canola or wheat in Saskatchewan, for instance, are probably going down a little bit. Not a lot, but it, it, they probably are going down a little bit. So but the paradox is, if you went to another part of the world where people produced food without fossil fuels, maybe using draft animals or just hoes, their emissions per ton are zero. So as our inputs go up, we, I guess what I'm saying there is in no way are we moving to somehow a low emission system. The more inputs we have in the system, we're just locking ourselves into this high emission system. Um, and then the second point about to what extent does the world rely on us? We certainly export a lot of grains, et cetera, but at the same time, we're, we're wasting about 40% of our food. We're taking huge amounts of it and turning it into ethanol and lighting it on fire. We're, we're over consuming a whole bunch more. We're taking a whole bunch and turning it into Cheetos and corn puffs and Coca-Cola, nutritionally disfigured food and overeating that. And that produces a whole bunch of food related illnesses and et cetera. So I think if we were rational about food and ate properly and healthily, we could, we could actually feed a lot of people with a lot less production and thus fewer inputs and thus fewer emissions. That's good. Thank you. Thank you very much, Darren. I really appreciate the presentation and your work. It's really great. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks.